Knapp. I'm a Kosh curator at the JSMA. I work with North American art, um, primarily regional art, um, but also with European work in our collection. And I was the in-house um, supervisor for Emily Shin's master's project, which is the exhibition by Fernand Leger, um, Le Cirque, that we see on these walls. And unfortunately, Emily is sick, so she's missing her talk tonight. So I'm going to do my best. <laughs> but she did successfully defend um, her thesis project last week. So this is the culmination of a master's project in the history of art and architecture, which is a really special thing because um, typically a student who's doing a master's program in art history would write a thesis paper, which is an impressive and monumental task in itself. Um, less often are students approved to do a thesis project in that department. And Emily was able to propose um, planning an exhibition of original research about um, a folio and art museum's collection that had not previously um, been shown in its entirety. And that was approved by her committee and she had a lot of support in the department to do this project. And so the museum really benefited because that meant we got to put this on view as one of our exhibitions and the schedule is fall. It's up through um, part of the next term. And um, it's just a wonderful way to show how the JSMA works with academic departments on campus and how students who want to have hands-on experiences in the museum are able to do so as part of their uh, formal degree program. So um, the exhibition that Emily planned that's on view here of the Cirque is, this was this folio um, over 100 pages um, that was published in 1950 in Paris, came to the museum. It was on loan initially for a couple of years and it was, was um, formally acquired a couple of years ago uh, from a local collector, Dr. Robert Leary, who's um, been very supportive of our museum's collections, especially helping us expand our European art holdings, which has not traditionally been um, a large part of our collecting practices. If you're familiar with our museum's history at all, uh, you know we were founded as an Asian art museum and have been focused on expanding uh, Pacific Northwest and American uh, Western work since the 60s, and then increasingly in the last 10 years, our collections development plan has just extended very ambitiously into a lot of different areas, and European has really grown in that time, which is wonderful for students who are studying this material um, on campus. And so uh, Emily, for the, for the project, just to give credit to all of the work that she did, she selected this as the source for her project. She studied all of the individual pages, made selections of what would be on view, and something that was really important to her in planning the exhibition was that the physical um, artist book be made available. So although we can't allow visitors to flip through the pages, um, as a private collector would be able to do, and certainly someone who would have purchased one of the 280 editions that were made of this book um, after it was published would be able to do, she wanted you to have that same experience of getting to see the narrative in, unfold in Leger's book. And so, you're able to, um, through this iPad, click on the Cirque and be able to scroll through all the pages there. But she also included scans of three artist books that are not in our collection that were the three other, um, the first of the artist books, or Livre d'Artiste, um, as they're referred to, the formal name in this show, um, that were published by the Greek-born publisher um, Teriad, who, is, uh, who was someone who was an editor and a publisher and really made a difference in sort of um, having this format for artist books gain, um, gain popularity. And he ended up working on 27 different um, publications. And so um, what is an artist book? Well, if we're looking at the pages here and the examples that we can see as we um, sort of enjoy this back and forth between full color illustrations, full page illustrations, pages devoted to text, pages with um, illustrations that are set into the text, you know, it's, it's artists who are making these handmade objects, um, moving away from mechanical modes of production. So instead of thinking about, um, you know, typeset books that might have illustrations included, the goal of these projects were to integrate the artist's hand and to make an object that's handmade and maybe especially using lithography, um, printmaking techniques that really lend themselves to an artist's own handwriting. Or in the case of Leger, you know, his calligraphy um, or his cursive Cirque title that we re, um, reproduced on our materials. And so allowing artists to have flexibility in creating their pages. Um, and so um, a little bit of background about Fernand Leger. He was a um, French-born artist. He was uh, he trained as an architect. He was a non-enrolled student at um, the Ecole des Beaux-Arts because he didn't, when he applied, he didn't get in, but he took classes anyway. But I think later said that time was kind of worthless to him. Uh, he dabbled in surrealism and cubism and purism. Um, he had served in World War I, and he was really influenced by 
um, the wartime experience. He was influenced in what he saw with the emergence of modernity and um, mechanization. And so in his earlier work, um, post 1900s, early 1910s, and we have an example on view around the corner too, as our master, in our Masterworks on Loan program, you can see an earlier painting by this artist um, from about 35 years earlier to compare. Um, you know, early 1900s, he was moving away from figurative work. And so you can see this great example of a more abstract, sort of form-focused um, exploration around the corner. Um, but by the time he was making this book in the 1950s, he was interested in the human form, and he was very interested in um, the circus, the idea of the circus and what it represented. And so um, there are sort of three components to his interest in the circus. His own childhood growing up in Normandy and encountering rural carnivals and performers there. Uh, and then the circuses that were popular and, and running year round in Paris. And that ranged from um, circuses that were catering to upper class. There were, there were circuses that were for um, sort of the artist communities. So all different levels of the social strata were able to find a circus that was catering to their, to their community. And he attended those. And then sort of that, the spectacle of the big top um, in the United States. So if you think of you know, the height of circus popularity um, in New York and all that that encompasses, he was interested in that as well. And the circus in general for artists and for writers and poets was something that um, certainly played with the imagination and allowed people who are kind of working in that space between what's real and what's fantasy to explore all the possibilities. And it also presented um, as a challenge for subject matter a way for artists to capture sort of the impossible feats that circus performers perform. So the idea of acrobats in the air or magic, you know, magicians performing tricks, all of that was um, was you know, rich fodder for their imaginations. And so this, what the more common um, types of um, Leonardo artists would have been an artist being commissioned to create original illustrations to accompany an existing text, a historical story or a natural sciences book. Um, but there were certainly publishers who were hiring artists to do the whole, to present the whole thing themselves. And this is an example of this book, um, the way Leger has, has made the search. He, I guess, initially had an outside writer who was providing a text for it, and it didn't meet his vision. So he scrapped that, and the publisher, Terry Odd, said, well, why don't you write it yourself? And so he did that. And the story that he takes um, readers or viewers through as he goes through the pages, you accompany Leger on this journey. Um, you know, he's, it's written in the first person, so you're accompanying him on this journey as you approach the circus, enjoy the circus, and then you leave. And so I can read a little bit of um, the translation for you and as you're kind of looking at these images. Here's how. And I'm happy to pass this around, too, if people want to um, read the whole thing while you're here. You can also find this um, online. But he starts with, uh, spend, and this is great on a cold day, too. Kind of, it's, it'll take us away from Oregon winter. It's going to send us somewhere else. Uh, spend your holidays with the same people. They are 200 kilometers away. They've changed their trousers. That's all. Take your bike. Stay a while. And a little side note is that um, Leger was in, interested in the circus and the circular forms that, that um, characterize the circus. Uh, but he was also interested in bicycles for a similar reason and the visual power of a bicycle and the circle being the primary component of how bicycles work, so a mode of transportation, and then the circle being repeated in the circus and how everything works together and operates almost like machinery itself. Uh, so he's, he's taking us on a bike ride. Turn to the right and plunge down the lane. Make contact with the locals. They are exactly like you and me and as clever as yourself, more clever in fact, but in different ways. Um, and he goes on describing, um, and later he says, the bicycle seems alive, an animal which refuses to go forward or backwards, whose willpower has to be taken into account. So not only is he showing us the scenes of the circus, but he's also taking on us on this journey where we're riding a bicycle and we're going from place to place with him too. And so that's a great thing about um, an artist creating a book is that they're then controlling the narrative and they're controlling the pacing of how you experience it. Um, they're storyboarding this in a way that if they were to just make these prints that could be, you know, obviously these are loose sheets in a folio, um, so they could have been organized in any order that someone might want to present them, but the intention is then for, for them to be uh, understood as a book. And of course the narrative going from page to page um, continues through that way as well. And I'll, um, I should point out too, let me, I like the ending of this as well, and then we can talk about a few more things while we're in this space. Um, so he also goes to a very philosophical place over the course of this, um, this story. And he says, at the end, an oak tree that can be destroyed in 20 seconds takes a century to grow again. 
Birds are still marv marvelously clad. Progress is a word devoid of meaning. And the cow which nourishes the world still only moves at three kilometers an hour. So an artist who's thinking about modernity and thinking about um, escapism in the form of a circus is also reminding us of ways that we sort of reconnect to our, to our reality in this story. Um, I should mention, too, that of the other artists whose books are included um, an iPad to look through, um, we have work here by Georges Ralt and Pierre Bernard and Henri Matisse. And um, one of our loans around the corner is also a Bernard painting. So if you're looking at these images and you want to look at examples of what these artists were doing um, in their studio paintings, you can go around the corner and take a look at that. And I think that I'll point out here, um, you know, the circus being a theme that Leger was interested in and exploring beyond this book, one of his paintings in the Guggenheim collection, that's one of his major works, that sort of brings together his early interest in mechanical forms, um, his earlier interest in shapes and forms as part of the tourism movement. Certainly the circus imagery that we see in this book is this, um, my little printout here of the Great Parade, an oil and canvas painting from 1954. So this is four years after this book was published. He did other editions of this same um, composition too that are in other collections. And this one's nine feet by 13 feet. So it's meant, this painting was meant to give us the circus as viewers, but to completely you know, give us an all-encompassing experience of approaching the circus and being surrounded by the spectacle. And when we think about well, what is he trying to provide in um, a Libre d'Artiste, for a singular viewer using that book to experience the circus, how might that differ from an artist who's then presenting that same subject matter on a large scale for more viewers? Um, so I'm sorry that Emily wasn't here tonight to talk at length about her amazing project, but um, certainly if you have questions for, for me, I can try to answer. If you have questions for her, I'm happy to send those questions along and provide her contact information too if you're interested in this material. And, um, I think maybe if there are any questions or comments here, we could take a few, and then we'll move into the Graves Gallery so we can hear Cheryl talk about one of the artists on view who's, of, um, uh, who's, who's one of the contemporaries of Leger. So these are, yes, and I, yeah, and I'm sorry that wasn't clear. These are images from the book that Emily selected to have on view to show um, beyond the pages in the book. So some of these would have been um, you know, printed on these double double sided pages, but they're all from the same project. So she had to she had a hard job to do in having to go through and decide what do you pull out of the entire book um, to put on view on the wall, since we knew that we wouldn't have the space available to frame the entire set of pages. So these are some examples to just get a sense of, of um, the variety of design on the pages. Yeah, great question. Do you have a question too? Um, these are, these were printed as, uh, I guess, lithographs as well, lithographs, because he had to do lithographs for his, to preserve his um, handwriting original drawings. Okay. Yeah. Should we move into the graves gallery? And then, and then we can come back in this space too if people have more time after. Well, I'm Cheryl Hartup, Associate Curator of Academic Programs, Latin American Art, and I'm really enjoying this space and these paintings, which we have on loan to us for a year. Um, we decided to present them in a very intimate space to start with. And then uh, in February, they're going to move into a larger gallery, and they will be presented with uh, contemporary works um, from artists from many different countries um, who are represented in our collection here. So. Um, I'm excited to show these works in different contexts. In the context of tonight, talking about modernism and Leger, I wanted to focus on Rufino Tamayo. Um, he showed with Leger in New York. Uh, he also depicted the circus um, in the, mostly in the 1930s. Um, he moved to Paris in 1950, and uh, who knows, you know, maybe perhaps that they uh, knew each other. Um, he also collected um, Leger's work. So if you go to the Museo de Rufino Tamayo in Mexico City, um, you'll see paintings by Leger. So he was very um, connected not only to uh, contemporaries from Mexico, but also to 
um, the school of Paris, uh, you know, as we would say. Um, so this work is done 1942, um, and uh, it's great to contrast it to Rivera's painting from 1931. Um, you can see, so it's a 10-year difference, but they're both in their early 40s when they're painting this, um, their works. Uh, Rivera, 1940, or he's 45, and Tamayo, 43. Um, and Tamayo is um, kind of rejecting um, the uh, dogmatism and nationalist sentiment of uh, Mexican muralism, focusing on um, specific political events, um, kind of picturesque, quaint, cultural images um, as they were, you know, critiqued, and also, um, you know, uh, overtly political work. So he's um, wanting to explore a more universal language, universal questions. Um, also focus a lot on uh, form and line and color, as you can see. So um, when he talks about um, the importance of art and being an artist, he talks about feeling, um, about having uh, a message, and um, also about um, connecting um, to the viewer um, through um, color, you know, you just, uh, it's so overwhelming. And he was very much influenced at this time um, by Picasso's Guernica. So you can see that in the work, which was, I mean, it's really incredible. Tamayo showed at um, a gallery just a few months before, Picasso had a show at that very same gallery of the Guernica, you know? So that was 1939. So Picasso um, was showing at the, the same place, and Tamayo, of course, um, was looking at his depiction of animals. And it really was a window for him to um, explore how can you talk about a specific political event, but in a way that's much more um, abstract and open and timeless, too? Um, so 1942, right? Our brains tap into um, what's going on in the world as World War II. And um, it's a time of great um, kind of paradox for um, Tamayo, he is having a very successful career. He is selling a lot of work. He's able to buy an apartment in New York City on the Upper East Side. He's teaching. He's making a lot of um, connections with um, you know, folks who are very influential um, in uh, culture. And he's selling uh, to uh, MoMA, to Art Institute of Chicago, to the Phillips Collection, um, Albright Knox, um, St. Louis Art Museum. So his works are, are um, ending up in some wonderful collections, and he's having a lot of success. But at the same time, he's feeling um, a lot of distress and angst just because of um, you know, what you're hearing about, what you're seeing, what you're um, reading and also personally to um, his uh, wife, Olga, is, is going through um, a very difficult time physically, psychologically. So sometimes people read you know, those um, feelings in, into the work as well. So um, it's Pero Ayoyando a la Luna, Dog Howling to the Moon. And um, it's in a very kind of curious um, space, right? He, he was a big fan um, not only of Picasso, but also of Brock. And he um, liked his austerity and also his um, somberness. 
Um, so you see, you know, these um, basic kind of uh, elements, architecture, landscape, um, and then so much attention placed to this larger than life, almost, um, I mean, some critics at the time read into it um, as a demonic hellhound, right? That's how some of the critics were writing about this figure um, in the center at the time. Um, others were, you know, talking about how Tamayo was tapping into um, his indigenous culture and um, looking to sources in Mexican folk art and pre-Columbian art. Um, and it must have been a really um, hard place for him to be because if you read the reviews of his work, and um, there's a lot of um, you know talk about um, you know his Aztec past, his Maya past. He's um, uh, you know a um, his Indian blood, his primitive spirit, you know, all of these things. Well, he was um, mestizo, but um, part uh, Zapotec. So it's kind of like this, you know, mishmash of uh, things, and at the same time kind of contrasting that to his, um, his sophistication, too, and kind of how he um, presented himself in... Um, well-to-do circles in New York City. So as I'm reading, you know, these reviews of the time and um, thinking about how hard, you know, it was um, for many of these artists from Mexico living um, in the United States for extended periods of time to kind of navigate, you know, those waters and to um, maybe, you know, not uh, deny things because they certainly help position you in a way that was beneficial, you know, both critically or economically to you. Um, but also, you know, I'm sure many things, you know, were just excruciating to read or to hear too um, for these figures. Um, but Tamayo really, um, he was seen as, you know, sort of the most legitimate one um, of the uh, artists at the time. Say, if you were thinking of some in the New York School, a Jackson Pollock, Adolf Gottlieb, um, a Mark Rothko, because um, he does have, you know, uh, uh, he is, you know, tied into. Um, through his heritage to an indigenous past of the Americas. Um, so there was much you know, emphasis placed on that of his legitimacy, his authenticity. And you know, again, re, uh, bringing up references to, say, um, ceramic figurines from uh, Western Mexico, the Cholo's quaintly dogs, the hairless dogs, who were um, often buried um, in burials. Uh, for a while, about 75% of the tombs in this area had um, these figures. And um, this is a dog who um, was not only consumed, <laughs> um, but also, you know, your um, protector in life and guide through Miklan, the underworld. So um, it's, it's very interesting also for me to think um, about uh, Tamayo, um, you know, at that point of Cirque at 1950. He, does, he never really becomes part of the New York school. He always has a distance um, from it. And he decides to... Um, well, he's enjoyed, you know, this time away from Mexico because he doesn't quite, you know, go along with kind of um, the um, uh, artists who are there and um, still, you know, working towards um, the mural movement or, you know, very strong uh, political messages um, in their work. Um, he 
he moves to Paris, and he never um, really gives up the figure in his work. Um, and he decides to spend time in Paris, and eventually he'll move um, back. Any questions about? And uh, oh yeah. No, oh yeah. Sure. Yeah. I'll yeah. Thank you for that question because color. How does he talk about color? And um, he talks about it in a very political way, which kind of takes one off guard. Um, he says, um, my work is about um, tragedy because Mexico has been um, an oppressed country. And the colors that I use are, um, they refer to colors that are um, widespread because they're very cheap. Um, because poverty is so prevalent here. So he's talking about blue used to dye fabric. Um, he's also talked about the red or oranges um, related to clay. Um, or he'll talk about earth tones, you know, just related to um, maybe, you know, like adobe or, you know, just um, earth colors. Sometimes people um, make references to, you know, the Oaxacan skies when they see this red. Um, but he says, you know, very, um, I use like the red and green, the more festive, you know, colors or the pink. We, we associate him, you know, it even I think at one time was called like the Tamayo pink, right? Um, but that those are, um, so he uses those colors very sparingly um, because they're more kind of festive and um, celebratory. But he, um, I think, um, predominantly used, although he really liked to use a few colors to kind of bring out all the tonal qualities. If you look at this, you know, this um, is that a tree? Is that a mountain? You know. Um, you see all of these different, yeah, hues and, and tones uh, in there. But um, bold color, definitely, but mostly um, primary, yeah, colors and very subdued. Yeah, and the blue, I, I maybe it's, I mean, one student as we were bringing, uh, as students were talking about um, these two paintings in Spanish to one another, um, they said, maybe that, you know, what flavor is that, right? <laughs> what flavor are the blue bones as opposed to the yellow bones? Because um, he wants uh, to engage all of the senses. So he wants you to hear that howl, right? And is it a howl in vain? How do we respond to that howl? Um, and yeah, what, what are the flavors? In 1950, he, he um, participated in the Venice Biennale. And um, he also, um, Andre Breton wrote about his work, which is so wonderful. He had a show at a gallery. And um, anyway, uh, he, um, he went on, he, did, he painted some murals, you know, in, in his career. Just right after this, he painted a mural for um, Smith College, their library. Um, so, you know, he, he did paint murals, um, but he just, um, his subject matter is, um, it's, uh, I guess, more um, open to interpretation rather than depicting, like, something very specific. Other 
comments or things that you want to He would, he painted like a, um, right onto the canvas, um, so not too many preliminary drawings, if, if any. So if you get up really close, you can see all of these strong lines where he's really building up this structure. He talks a lot about the structure um, of the image. And um, I mean, you see like these white lines, these black lines. Um, and you can really feel him like um, creating that uh, form, you know, through line right on the canvas there. Did the dog um, have any meaning in his um, in his uh, iconography of uh, subjects to paint? Like, like you mentioned Picasso and uh, yeah. Guernica. And uh, in Picasso's work, the horse, mm -hmm. the bull, you know, they, 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 they appear over and over and over, and they are like characters whipping this over. Um, is, is there anything like that on the dogs on Tamayo's work? Well, he, um, during the 40s, like say 41 to maybe, you know, the time um, the war ended, he, painted a number of images and he would not paint like a series all at once you know he would go painting by painting sometimes you know he would work on two because one would need to be drawing but he did focus a lot on animals and dogs appear you know um, frequently during this period in all different um, some are like a rabid dog or some maybe it's a couple dogs he did paint a horse with a lion kind of coming around the back side of it. Um, he painted another dog with a serpent in front of it. So sometimes it's kind of predator prey or this sort of confrontational, more aggressive um, uh, image that's being put forth. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's, it's more, um, say, solitary but um, I think all of them communicate um, yeah this um, a kind of agony at, at the time or a fear or you know some kind of um, tension um, but it's uh, it's during a particular period. He would he would go on and paint um, dogs later, but they have a very they they they're different in in how they look. You know, um, it's not um, it's yeah a different kind of um, feeling that's being communicated. But yeah, not say representing a particular country or fascism or um, you know some sort of nationalist symbol. Um, and a lot of people, you know, again listening to hundreds of <laughs> freshmen uh, coming through to look at these paintings and talking about them in Spanish. A lot of them don't even see a dog there. They see a cow. And they insisted, no, it's a cow, you know? And I'm like, that's OK, you know? I, that's fine. That's a cow, you know, then, right? So. Um, oh, was he himself? Um, no, but at the time. Uh, I mean, I think uh, his, um, because his, his wife was going through, yeah, great, um, um, like, psychological 
um, pain. I'm sure he, yeah, was speaking with a lot of doctors and um, perhaps reading, yeah, at this time um, about psychological mm -hmm. angst. Um, but maybe different than someone, than say the surrealists or, you know, Frame? The oh, frame good part question. Of... We think not. But the, yeah, that's a good question. I'd have to go back into like archives from the gallery and you know see if they have installation shots. Yeah. But um, it was in. Uh, it was the only one in a private. A long time. All the other images of animals from the 40s were in public collections because they sold very they sold very well at the time. But this one um, went into a private collection and just came up at auction. So that's why we now have access to it because the person who purchased it is a nonprofit foundation. Yeah. Um, yeah. I know yeah. an artist that works in Mexico that includes a lot of her own dogs in oh. her paintings. I'm wondering if you know whether he had He, he had dogs. He did. He had dogs um, always. And then he uh, collected um, these pre Columbian, um, yeah, ceramic. Uh, Colima dogs as well, but much yeah later um, in life. But yeah, he he grew up with with dogs. Not this. I don't think this breed. Yeah, but yeah. Can I ask you a quick question about yeah. the uh, yeah. yeah. I can't help but think of uh, on the Espuso. Yes. I mean, can you see that? Yes. or dialogue that would have gone on in terms of, you know, the jumbo paintings of Rousseau, it's very similar. Maybe like I would think so, and I wish I had more uh, information, but um, since um, Rivera, you know, spent a decade or more in Paris, um, I feel like he would have, yeah, seen that work or yeah, was familiar with it since he was very tapped into the avant-garde there. Yeah. Yeah, you can really see like this was modern in a totally different way. Like modernism and modern have take on so many different definitions. Um, so this was very modern. It was shown at the, the Museum of Modern Art, right? Um, but for completely different reasons than, say, a Tamayo would be um, connected to modernism. Yeah, I just have to mention this one quote because I find it so funny. I don't know if any of you will find it funny. But this is on the front page of the New York Post in 1947, right? A picture of Tamayo, a big article about Tamayo. And the headline is, none of those little donkeys for me. I mean, so wild that he was really um, coming out um, um, again, sort of stereotypes or, you know, certain kinds of perceptions of what he should be painting or, you know, if, um, and gosh, um, this uh, critic 
who um, um, wrote in a gallery brochure for um, Julian Levy Gallery when Tamayo showed his work there, he said, okay, so he said, quote, his art is Mexican because he never tried to make it Mexican, but to make it art. I just leave you with those two <laughs> words. Yeah. And thank you for. Thank you, Cheryl.